chapter 28. And uh, a familiar text with a lot of us, but not for everybody. I get it. I mean, I think we've said that over the years. I know Bishop has made that comment before. Some things that are common to people, what we think is, is common to some, is not for everybody. And I understand that. And, but we're going to look into Deuteronomy chapter 28. I'm not going to really be, I'm, I mean, I don't, I know I can teach, but I'm just going to just uh, let this go. And uh, we'll, we'll go from there. And, uh, but Deuteronomy chapter 28, in this chapter we know Moses has exhorted the nation with choice. The covenant God made with Israel contained three major features in this chapter. The law, the sacrifice, and the choice. The idea behind the choice is that God was determined to reveal himself to the world through Israel. So if you have your Bible, it's in the notes. If you have the mobile app, it's on there as well. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, I'm going to read 1 through 10 in the New Living Translation. If you have it, say amen. If not, you better catch up. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1, and it reads this way, New Living Translation. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands that I am giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. First, we look at one. He makes a statement right here. He says, if you fully obey the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but if we look at the word here, fully obey, we understand that God is not, there's three things we can do. We can fully obey God, we can partially obey God, or we can completely disobey God. How often do, does many of us do one of those three? Either we fully obey, partially obey, or unfortunately a lot of us will completely disobey God completely. And so this is the promise to the children of Israel right here where he says it really clear. If you fully obey me, say fully with me, fully. So that means all of you, everything I say, you must do, fully obey. Verse 2, you will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. Listen, you will experience all of these blessings if, there's an if in there, if you obey the Lord your God. Verse 3, your towns and your fields will be blessed. We understand now this is a cultural text and back then we had majority of the people got their money from farming, cropping, and doing that from, you know, plowing in the fields, getting their stuff. So we understand the context of this word is being spoken to a a time frame where this made more sense than it does today's terminology. Now, unless you're a farmer, then yes, you would understand this terminology. But we also understand your towns. We live in Muncie, Indiana. This is our town. Your town and your fields will be blessed if, we said, if you obey the Lord. For your children and your crops will be blessed. This is a promise. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be blessed. It's saying generation upon generation upon generation shall be blessed if you fully obey the Lord. Verse 5, your fruit baskets and breadboards will be blessed. 6, wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. I like that right there. Everything and everywhere that I go, whatever I do, he will bless me. That's where it says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. We know that scripture. And wherever God tells me to go, he shall surely bless my steps, right? Seven, the Lord, I love this part right here. The Lord will conquer your enemies when they attack you. They will attack you from one direction and they will scatter from you Seven ways is, is one other particular passage. The Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do and will fill your storehouses with grain. The Lord your God will bless you in the land 
he has given you. I want you to understand, he makes a statement here. He said, the Lord will guarantee. We understand in life there's not a whole lot of guarantees. There's, a, there's sometimes in life we understand there's not a whole lot of people that can back up what they say. I've sold cars for the majority of my life, or a lot of my life. I'll say it that way. I'm 47 now. Can't be majority. Uh, for a lot of years, and I remember we would say, you got warranty with this. And all of a sudden, Chad can understand this statement. Well, did you put oil in it? No, I forgot to put the oil in the car. Sorry, vo- uh, warranty voided. We ain't going to do anything for you. So there was no guarantee for everything. In that particular thing. But what God is saying right here, he's telling the children of Israel, if they fully obey my voice, the Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do. And he will fill your storehouses with grain. The Lord will bless you in the land he is giving you. Nine. Here it is again. There's this word. If you obey the commands of the Lord, your God, and walk in his ways, the Lord will establish you as what? His holy people, as he swore he would do. Then all the nations of the world will see that you are a people claimed by the Lord. And I like this part right here. And this is where I close. And they will stand in awe of you. How? Why will they stand in awe of you? Of us. Why will they stand in awe of the children of Israel? Because we have fully decided to walk and obey the voice of God. And when we obey the voice of God and we fully begin to walk towards Him, then He will make the road wide. He will open up doors that have been closed for such a long time. He will shut the door of those doors that do not need to be opened. And the naysayers and the accuser of the brethren, He'll close the mouth. And I like what He says. He said, When the enemy comes and tries to attack you, He said, He'll make it it flees seven ways. This is the promise that we have. And they will stand in all of you. Now here's a disclaimer. By God sending his son, Jesus Christ, as the true seed of Abraham, the true son of David, and in a profound sense, the true Israel himself, Jesus fulfilled all that Israel was destined for when he shed his blood upon the cross of Calvary that you and I now may have eternal life through the blood and now every person Jew or Gentile who trusts in Christ and receives him as the sacrificial lamb of God is united to him and becomes part of this true Israel in Christ. I wanted to throw that disclaimer because I've heard people say, well, that was for the Old Testament. That was for the children of Israel. Listen, we are sons of Abraham. We are of the seed of David. Therefore, now that we've accepted Jesus Christ, the promises that God had spoken, they're ours for us to receive. I just want to throw that disclaimer out there. Now listen, they will stand in all of you, he says. Now, I'm going to try to appeal to, and I know there's not a, I, I'm going to say we're all young in this room, and, uh, but there's this thing going around they call verified now. These guys are verified. You're on Twitter, you're on TikTok, and you're verified. They have this check mark, they call it. It's a blue check or green check, I'm not sure. But if you're verified, like your son, Aaron Stick Smith, is verified. What that means is that he's of a status that not the average person can be at in in that world of whatever we want to call fame. And so verified, we hear this terminology with the younger generation quite often. To be verified is simply a big deal in this culture we are living in. If you are verified on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok, then then it says that you are of importance and have a higher status than your normal users. So you have a check mark show that you are verified. So in other words, if you are verified, then you are set apart from everybody else. So, so this is a, and it's funny because Trinity will say these things to me. Like, Dad, did you know so-and-so's verified? And it's like, what does that mean? Like, 
what does that mean? So I had to like look this stuff up. It means you're on a status level. You're on a level that is like famous in her words. And so if she was here, she would understand what I'm saying, but I think she went back there with the kids. But, but there's fame. And so what does it mean to be set apart? The Bible says that we are to separate ourselves. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and 18. In the New Living Translation, it reads this way, Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. As the uh, King James will say, don't be unequally yoked. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers. And here's that word. And separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. And I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now we understand that Paul in this text is talking about marriage being unequally yoked in this sense, but we must understand that the concept has more to do with what we are connecting ourselves to. God has set the principle early when he says, if you obey my commands, if you do what I tell you to do, if you walk after what I tell you to walk, then this shall come. Then then it goes on and says, blessed shall you be in the field, blessed shall you be going in, coming out. You'll be the head, not the tail, above, not beneath, the lender, not the borrower. He begins to uh, declare the things that we are called to be simply by what? Obeying the commands of God. And he also goes on later to says, you know, curse shall you be if you disobey my voice. And, but we're going to talk about this. Listen, if you obey my commands, this shall come. Paul says this, what harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? The question presented here is hyperbolic because there can be no unity between these two. That is like water and oil. They just don't blend together. So we should ne- we understand this concept because we, the Bible says to be ye separate, be, uh, come out from among them, and yet sometimes we want to hold on to some things that we have no business holding on to. We have no business holding on to yesteryears, yesterday, things we've done in our past, but sometimes we can't seem to shake these things. Because there's such a heavy weight that is upon us. You know, I heard, a, I heard a man say one time how he struggled with alcoholism. And he began to tell me, uh, he began to tell me though, it, it, I feel like it calls me. I feel like at night I hear it talking to me. I feel like when I feel like I got an edge on it, it seems to get louder in my ear. It's, and I want it so bad knowing I shouldn't go to it. Understand, we know that we have to let things go. We have to put aside those things that weigh us down even. But the question here is, we cannot cannot be connected with things that are not, uh, not of God. He says, there shall be no harmony in this. There can't be harmony between Christ and the devil. Satan has always tried to divide the body of Christ because if we become unified then we can do anything. Do you believe that? You know, sometimes I look at church today, and I wonder if they really believe some of this stuff. I wonder because we are so divided often. It seems like we listen to the enemy, as I was talking about the alcoholic, the drunk, who who struggles on a daily basis because he's hearing that voice say, drink, take of this cup, do this, do that, and turn to that thing. But yet I come into the churches today, and here's what I see, division often. 
We say we love them to their face, but we backbite and we tail bear. And I don't understand the concept because it's like we are hearing the enemy speak and then we act. We, I don't believe that we intentionally want to do this, but unfortunately we fall into that snare or that trap. So Satan has always tried to divide the body of Christ. Because if we become unified, then we can do anything. Listen, regions can be taken. Regions can be taken back. Cities can be taken back when the body of Christ become unified. You know what else can happen? Families can be reunited when we become unified. Marriages can be mended when we become unified. The church, the body of Christ, can be producers instead of just receivers. And here's the thing, we have to unify. The Bible, the enemy is always trying to devour, and he always tries to bring division. If he can only divide and conquer, if he can divide, he can conquer, is what I'm saying. And so we have to understand the tactics of the enemy. And, and, and he is trying to bring division in the body. But here is what I see the body of Christ or the church doing today. And there's this thing, again, I'm going to use a young terminology for us young crowd here. It's called chasing clout. Have you ever heard that statement? Anybody ever heard that statement? You're chasing clout? See, man, I thought you all were a young crowd. See, I didn't know this either. I had to <laughs> Somebody had to tell me what that was about. Chasing clout, but this made sense. This is preachable, and this is why I'm preaching it. Chasing clout. Here's what I see the body of Christ or the church doing today. Chasing clout. Clout is simply influence. They're chasing influence or power. We've got this twisted over the years in the churches. Churches across America are chasing clout right now. Everywhere I look, I can turn on YouTube, I can flip on TBN, I can flip on the Daystar Network, and they're chasing clout is what they're doing. They're, they're churches across America. How many viewers can we get online? Trying to keep up with the church down the road with their design or even their style. We're creating the hippest or most popular podcasts as we're compromising the Word of God while we do it. There's a popular minister right now going around, and there's many. This is just one most recently. Popular minister trying to keep their clout by compromising what the Word of God says to where we are hearing some say, well, the Word of God wasn't necessarily written by God. Technically, it was written by man, which is true, for them to ignore what God is saying about sin is what they're saying. Well, that was this guy. Well, well, really what Paul was trying to say, and this was actually Paul, some things he was saying, taking the validity of who, what the word of God, that men were breathed upon by the Holy Ghost, inspired by God to speak what he saw, and they wrote down what they experienced now we have famous people, famous preachers, I'll say it, are going around trying to ignore what God is saying about sin to justify sinful behavior, to justify our sinful nature. Even though we know we are wretched inside, our, our flesh is always wants to do wrong, we understand it, and that doesn't give me a pass to do whatever I want to do. I can't take the word and try to justify my bad actions or my, my bad decisions and say, well, God didn't. This was a man that said this. My God, dangerous times that we are living in. And we need to know the word or what the word of God says today more now than ever before. Or we will be convinced and straight away from this kind of heresy and nonsense. I don't know about you, but I get irked in my spirit when I hear certain preachers or pastors say, well, I don't believe God really meant it like that. I struggle with me trying to justify my sins and saying, God, just check that off and say it's all good. 
so I don't have to feel conviction anymore. Listen, God is calling those who want to obey his commands. He said, if they obey my commands. The church has turned into clout chasers now or influencers instead of being God chasers or kingdom builders. That's the unfortunate part we see with the, with the, uh, the state of the church today. Uh, last night, I believe, President Joe Biden gave the State of the Union the address. When we look at the state of the church today, I, I, I'm saddened to see what I'm seeing. We are not seeing the full power of God being manifested in the churches today because I have a feeling we are lost our focus and we are chasing clout. <laughs> Hate to sound like this, but unfortunately, we, all, we can all fall guilty into some of this. Try to keep up with the Joneses. Try to keep up with the modern church today. But I want to be a kingdom builder. I want to be a God, in, I want to influence people strictly by the works of the finished work of the cross. I want to work with God, not against him. Look at Matthew 6, 33. Familiar text, one of my favorite scriptures in, this, in the Bible. But seek ye first. Here's what, the, here's what the word of God is saying. But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. What's, what is he saying to us? He's telling us to do something first. What is he saying? Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The kingdom of God has been neglected in the modern church today. The kingdom simply is, is in the Greek is basilia, which means royal power, kingship, dominion rule, not to be confused with an actual kingdom, but rather the right or authority to rule over a kingdom of the royal power of Jesus as the triumphant Messiah. Righteousness, I'm not going to try to pronounce this Greek word, it's, yeah, it starts with a D, it's in your notes, dikasoun, uh, which means integrity, virtue, purity of life, rightness, correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. So in other words, Jesus is saying, seek first my authority to rule in the royal power of Jesus and my integrity, virtue, purity of life, and my correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting, and all these other things shall be added to you. Here's what we're not doing. We are not seeking to be more like Christ anymore. We're just seeking, I don't know what we're seeking anymore, but when I come into the house of God, I'm not seeing a people who are thirsty and hungry for righteousness anymore. I hate to, hate to say it that way. Sometimes I have to look in my mirror and God checks me often and he'll say, Nathan, seek me more than you ever have before. Live and talk like me, walk like me, live like me. And I'm seeing the church not resembling that anymore. We're trying to shoot for clout. We're trying to stay in what's, what's, what's happening. I'm not speaking just for death. I'm not speaking to destiny. I'm speaking in general. We see the church becoming weak. We see the body of Christ becoming weaker and weaker instead of stronger and more powerful than we've ever been. We're supposed to do signs, miracles, and wonders are supposed to follow us to them that believe. And what are we seeing? We're seeing doom, destruction, despair, divorces, right and left in the church. Are we seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Are we seeking his righteousness? Are we, are we seeking his integrity? I want to be like Christ. I want to talk like Christ. I want to react like Christ did. Christ didn't just smack people across the head when they talked to him or made, did, made accusations. Christ didn't just turn around and start saying, hey, Leah, did you hear what so-and-so did? You know, I don't, I don't know why she would just run her mouth like that. Christ never responded like that, but yet we do. So are we seeking his righteousness? Are we seeking his righteousness? That's a question that I want you to internally look at. Look at. Are we seeking his virtue? 
Are we seeking the correctness of thinking and feeling and as action? The church today has no problem seeking power and influence, but it's forgetting that you have to seek after how to walk like him first, talk like him first, and respond like him too when adversity comes our way. We want the power. God send the power down on heaven. Lord, I'm the head. We begin to speak this. We're guilty of it. We'll begin to speak things like this. I am the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. But I'm not seeking after righteousness. I'm not obeying the commands of God. This is something we have to evaluate on ourselves. Are we seeking? Are we obeying? Are we looking to the king? And seeking after him. Or are we just seeking for his powers? You know, if you have that rich uncle, which I don't. If you have that rich uncle, you almost wait until he's like, is he going to die? Because you, maybe you don't have that deep relationship with him. But that when that, that when that uncle's about to pass, you know, if he's rich, then you might be taken care of if, if time goes by. We're looking for the power. We're looking for the stuff. We're looking for the things that people can give us or God can give us, but we're not looking to be more like him. Listen, some of us got to turn off our TVs. Some of us got to shut our phones down because our focus is built on this. And we, we can be guilty in this world. Facebook can be demonic if you let it. Uh, Twitter can be evil if we let it. YouTube can be wicked if we let it. Netflix can be wicked if we let it. Because if we're seeking after that all the time, then we're going to get what we're seeking after. Now, I choose to tell myself, Nathan, you got to spend as much time in either prayer, listening to preachers, get on a, a Christian podcast as much as you spend time watching Netflix or much as you spend time looking at YouTube or even watching a two and a half hour basketball game. Am I willing to seek God's face like I'm wanting to watch LeBron James hit that shot to beat Kareem Abdul-Jabbar to go above? Am I intensely seeking after God? in his righteousness, like I'm seeking after money and wealth and power and authority and dominion on this earth? Am I seeking after God the way I should be? Our response, our response should always be, I'm focused upon you, God. I have to put you first. You told me to seek you first, the kingdom of God. And then all these other things shall be added. Why am I seeking after all these other things and forgetting the very first thing you told me to seek after? Hey, I'm, this, this word was smashing me this week. Romans chapter 16, 25 and 26. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all the nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God, here it is, for obedience to the faith. Here we have that word again, obedience. Obedience is the key to your next breakthrough. Obedience is the key to your next level. Let me say it this way. Obedience is the key to destiny's next level, to Bridgeway's next level, to whatever bishops, God speaks into his spirit of what we're supposed to do next. It's going to take obedience to please God. Look what the Bible says. Obedience, well, obedience to God is not only a way to worship him, but a way to get closer to him. Prepare for whatever he leads you to and grow as a person is what obedience does. Look what 1 Samuel 15, 22. I'm almost done. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. And here's the key. And submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Listen, the rewards for obedience are clear. You will be blessed wherever you go. 
The rewards for obedience are clear here. Your children will be blessed. Now listen, me and Jessica have strived to try to live a holy life. We've tried to be God-fearing. We've tried to do things the right way. And my kids can make choices, not always good choices. And that doesn't reflect me necessarily. I have to trust the word of God that he said that if I obey his voice and I do what he says, blessed shall even my children be. And then I look at my kids now and they're both in church. I look at my son back there probably teaching some junior high and senior high kids back there. I'm, and I'm happy about this. And, and, and here's why. Because I understand the, re, the rewards for obedience. That my children will be blessed to a thousand generations. Not only will Isaiah and Trinity be blessed, but Isaiah's children and his, his children's children shall be blessed. Because we put Christ first. And I have to be obedient to his voice. I've said this a hundred times. I did not want to be here in Muncie. I did not. Jessica can vouch this. I did not. I had no desire. But God said, obey my voice. Obey my commands. And it took an old rascal like Julius and Roy Paget to come to, to, to Abounding Grace in Salina, Ohio. And I remember Julius saying to me, you're the man. And I, I was thinking to myself, I was like, thank you, man. Thank you, brother. And he goes, no, you're the man God's calling. And maybe he was in his moment right there, and I, I laughed about it as I told this story before. But I laughed about it, and I said, I have no desire. I don't know what they're talking about. But then time went on. And as I began to seek his righteousness, as I began to seek his face, I met up with Bishop O'Neill on a November day in Portland, Indiana. And you know something? The rest is history. And you know what? We're still writing our destiny. What we're going to see in the next year, I'm feeling this right now. What we're about to see in the next year is going to blow our minds. I believe that we're going to see an influx in the house. Not only just that our, our pews are filled, our chairs are filled, but we're going to see a hunger like never before. Because we're operating in what? Obedience. You know, I know bishops, if he was here, he'd probably tell, he's told me, but he's nervous about doing what we're supposed to do next. But here's what he says, I have to obey God. I have to trust God. Because you know what's going to happen? When we obey his commandments, when we obey his voice, what's going to happen? God is going to step on the scene and work on our behalf. That's the promises of obedience. That's, that's the rewards for obedience. Number, number three, God will protect you is a reward for obedience. He will grant you abundant prosperity. Everything you set your hand on will be successful. I'm believing for a launch will be successful. Destiny Christian Center will grow astronomically from this because of obedience to the word of God, and the Lord will help you to stand out. These are the rewards for obedience, and they're clear. Now, I'm not trying to preach prosperity messages here, but I'm here to declare what the word of God says, Psalm 37, 25. I was young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. What is he saying? I've never seen the righteous forsaken. That's prosperity. Prosperity is not only just financially. It's also uh, thriving. It, it, it means to thrive in things. And so when God says do it, he's going to make you thrive. When God says do this, he's going to make you go to a next level. He's going to allow you to go to a next level where they can't look at us and say, by golly, it's because he's a charismatic preacher. That's why God is moving. No, no, no. Man is not going to get the glory in any of this. This is God who is going to get all the glory of this. Amen. And I'm going to close with this. 
It's time for the body of Christ to come out. Come out wherever you are. Come out from your sinful nature. I'm talking to you at home. Come out from your sinful nature. Come out and be separate from the unbelievers. Come out from your sinful past and walk after his righteousness. Walk after his virtue. Walk after his integrity. That you can look in the mirror and say, God, I want to be more like you. 